Hey, it's Sarah here to tell you about the Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all in one dryer brush. I just took this traveling with me and it is amazing in that it is a three in one tool. I didn't have to pack extra equipment with me just for my hair on this trip. It has a hair dryer, it is a volumizer, it is a detangler. It can do all of these things in one step. The large oval brush creates glam, waves, the bristles painlessly remove knots as you dry and style. It uses ionic technology to create a frizz-free look effortlessly. Speaking of that frizz-free look, there are three heat settings plus a cool setting that will lock in your look for effortless looking hairstyles. It's got a bonus volumizing attachment included that gives you added lift at the roots and the removable attachments make storage at home or away super easy. Like I said, I just traveled with it and it was so easy and so convenient. If you would like your very own Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all-in-one dryer brush, simply go to conair.com and search dryer brush. Again, that is conair, C-O-N-A-I-R.com and search dryer brush. Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am coming to you once again from Giant Bear Studios in the uh, spare room in my parents' house in Montana. So welcome back to this crazy little makeshift studio I have going on. I am so excited about today's episode because I got the opportunity for my 10 year old niece to ask some of the questions and she was really excited um, and <laughs> she was really excited and, and a little nervous and um, she was kind of bouncing around in her chair and so she's she she asked some of the questions and and then at one point toward the end as we were chatting a little more um, she just kind of wandered away. I don't know if she went and got a snack or whatever. But anyway, she asked all the questions that she was supposed to ask. And she really liked the book. And she loved being able to be a part of this. So again, her name, um, she's my 10 year old niece, I've mentioned her probably a million times. Her name is Risa, she'll be 11 the end of August. And it was so much fun. I was laughing when we started reading the book. The book, by the way, is uh, Finding My Yip by Christine Isley Farmer. And I was reading it to not only my 10 year old niece, but also my 15 year old niece was hanging out with us and listening and my sister was doing something in the same room that we were in. And so we opened the book and the first line of the book is something like, mommy had just finished giving us our tongue baths. <laughs> and all four of us went, wait, what? We had not realized that the book was told from the point of view of the dog, which it is. Um, it is it is told from the point of view of the puppy in the story. So that made Risa even happier because in a former life, she was a dog. I'm telling you, she loves dogs so very much. She has approximately 8 million stuffed dogs in her possession, in her collection, and she loves them, and she pretends to be a dog, and so this was the perfect book for her to, for, for us to read together and for her to join me on this interview. Let's, um, let me tell you what the book is about. <laughs> Obviously, there's a dog in it. Again, it's called Finding My Yip. It's the first book in a series of um, books that will be called Boomer's Tales. Boomer, that's the dog, is a cavalier King Charles Spaniel who is unable to yip. Boomer lives with Nana Weathers, a musician who possesses a magic ring. Boomer quickly bonds with Nana's nine-year-old granddaughter, Chloe, who has a stutter. Her big wish is to sing like Nana. Chloe and Boomer make new friends at dog obedience school and grow their confidence. By learning up 
excuse me, by teaming up in the music room and gaining a little help from their friends. Will Chloe and Boomer find their voices? So there's a little bit of magic. There is a wonderful relationship between a nine-year-old girl and her dog. Again, that was something else that was relatable for Risa, who's a little bit older than Chloe, but uh, understands. And you'll hear Risa has some trouble with her R's. So she's working on that. So she could definitely understand some of the, the issues that that Chloe and Boomer go through. In fact, in the car the other day, she was reading Squirrel Girl, and uh, she had told my mom, her Nana, again, another another coinc- another thing in common that she has with Chloe. Uh, she had told Nana that the other day that Squirrel Girl was a really good book for her to read and uh, to practice reading out loud because she needs to work on her R's. So she is working on those R's. And while I know that the that little bit of a speech it's not really a speech impediment, but you know, uh, children often have issues with certain letters. Uh, I know that she needs to work on those R's, but part of me will be a little sad when the R's, the the cute, um, the cute, the cute way she speaks now goes away. But I know that, you know, she has to grow up. So at any rate, let's go ahead and turn to the interview with Christine so she can tell you more about the writing of the book, uh, her inspiration for Boomer and Chloe, how many books she wants to see in this series, etc. Again, the book is called Finding My Yip. The author is Christine Isley Farmer. Hi, Christine. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sarah. It's nice to be with you today. We are excited to have you here. Um, as I mentioned before, I am here with my 10-year-old niece, Risa, and she's going to be asking some of the questions. We're, we're going to be talking about your book, Finding My Yip. But before we get to the book, can you share a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I am a former professional classical singer and now a retired uh, university professor where I coordinated the voice area and taught voice-related courses. Uh, And my my writing career began before now because I was writing academic articles for publication. But creativity writing started as a childhood. After my retirement, I decided that I wanted to write the series of books. So uh, that's a little bit about myself and my background. So it may that leads into talking about finding my lip. Yep. <laughs> I found my lip in finding my yip, too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And we could probably do a whole podcast just on your professional singing career because it sounds like you've had some uh, – I was reading your the, the biography on the book, and it sounds like you've had some pretty cool experiences. I have. I was lucky enough to live in Europe for a while, and I sang in a house there for six years, and wow. traveled and sang in England and then Ireland, and um, and I have also sung with uh, regional opera companies here in the United States, and that's before I uh, started my academic career as a teacher. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, can you share um, the premise of finding my yip? Okay. <clears throat> I think that Finding My Yip is a book about teamwork, trust, and friendship between humans and humans and animals and animals with animals. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And specifically in Finding My Yip, uh, the animals are dogs. Right. Yes. And what, um, this is for younger readers, what age group would you say is the best for this, this book? Well, Amazon has it for ages 7 to 12, but the protagonist in the book is nine-year-old Chloe. So Mm -hmm. usually um, most most readers like to read up. Uh, So I think it's it's all right for a 12-year-old also, but um, it's probably, if you're reading to your child, I think you could read, a five or six-year-old would appreciate it too, as long as you explained what words mean and there's a glossary in the back of the book anyway that helps out with that for children mm-hmm. who are reading or are yeah. learning to read. But there are tricky words that they need to know the meanings of. So, yeah. But Which I guess very Amazon runs it 12 to tw- 7 to 12. Right. But most, most parents are, or, or caregivers are going to know the, the, you know, what their children are 
capable of reading and interested in reading. So it probably depends on each reader. Exactly. And and uh, Risa is um, 10, right? She's 10, yep. And, and so uh, this, was, this was fairly easy read for her, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. In fact, I, I, I was reading aloud to her um, and her sister, and she would sometimes correct me when I missed a word. So she was reading right along with me. That's good. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, Risa, <laughs> did you understand most of the words and the vocabulary? Yes. Were there any words you didn't understand? Do you remember? No. No. And if I did, I asked mommy about it. Yeah. There you go. If she did, she asked her mom about it. So. Okay. Um, that's good. All right, Risa, you have the next question. Do you want to ask it? What was your inspiration for the story? What was the inspiration for my story? Well, mm-hmm. I had a lot. I had a lot of inspiration for the story. Um, I would say that my inspiration is from my own background of being a child who loved to sing and dance and act. I used to uh, play in my yard and make up songs and even get together with uh, neighborhood children and we would put on shows. We would throw, of all things, we would throw like a bedspread over top of a picnic table and we would dress underneath that picnic table and put on our ballet costumes and our cap costumes and we would dance, we'd invite our parents in the neighborhood community to come and watch us all perform. So the inspiration of this was to have, uh, I know children enjoy the arts, and I wanted to have a child who, like I, uh, wanted a love singing. However, she has a problem, and that problem is that she has a stutter, as you, as you read. So mm-hmm. her greatest wish is to be able to sing like her grandmother. Yeah, because her my mother is a music teacher, and mm-hmm. uh, the inspiration for me came from my childhood. Actually, I okay. think a lot of things that you write for children can come from your own childhood or your own background. Absolutely. And the other thing that was an inspiration too was, I remember growing up, I had dogs and I had cats, and I can remember I would talk to my dogs and my cats, and they w- I would tell them things that I was not always willing to share with my parents. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that, that relationship between animals and, and children, I think it's important. Uh-huh. Risa, you talk to your dog, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. She also has a blue butt right now. She also has a blue butt right now. Risa would like everyone to know. She's been drawing in, ch- in sidewalk chalk on the front uh, the front porch, and the dog keeps rolling in it. So um, the <laughs> white Shih Tzu is now blue. <laughs> a blue <laughs> dog. I think you're using blue. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, what's your dog's name, Risa? Lola. Rosa? Lola. Yeah. Rola. Okay. Well, you might have to change that name to Blue. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to. <laughs> or or she, could just, she could be Lola Blue. Yep, yeah. Lola Blue, good. Lola, yeah. <laughs> so, Christine, can you talk a little bit more about Chloe, who is the human character, and Boomer, who is the puppy? Um, what about them and their relationship do you think will resonate with your readers? Well, I think that, the, you know, what I just said about that intimacy between dogs, animals, and humans. And whether you're mm-hmm. adult, I'm an adult, and I, I have a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel like the one in the book. Um, you know, I, I talk to him all the time. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think the relationship between humans and animals is very important. And no matter what the animal is, I think at any age we can find some kind of, whether it's a horse or a goat or a uh, a cat, uh, birds, uh, there's something about that interaction between humans and animals to me that's very important. So I think that reading this book, you can uh, learn that. But also Chloe is in a, a difficult situation because this is not explained in the book, but this is part of my backstory, which is, you know, you develop, I develop my characters and a backstory before I start writing. Mm-hmm. So Chloe's backstory 
is that her parents were killed in a, a car wreck. Yeah. And she had a stutter before that. But the fact that she has to move to live with her grandmother in a new community, going to a new school, making new friends, has increased the problem that she has with her stutter. And also, it has affected her confidence. Mm -hmm. So meeting this dog, this puppy, who is in the home of her grandmother, who is taking care of the mama dog and the three puppies while the owner is away on a trip, uh, she notices that Chloe writes poetry, and she notices that um, her grand went after she goes upstairs to get her poetry book and, and uh, to get her poetry book. Uh, she notices that Nana is in the kitchen singing, and she notices that the other puppies start to sort of yip along with Nana singing. And Boomer tries to do so, but he can't. Mm -hmm. He's like he's a yipless pup. Yeah. And she uh, whispers in his ear. You remember reading this? I wish I could sing like Nana. Yep. So immediately we have a bond. We yes. have empathy between two beings. Yes. And we think that's important to learn to know a little bit about Chloe and her problem with stuttering and what her main desire is and you learn that in the first you learn that in the first chapter I want to sing like my mama Nana yeah but yep. the problem is is she can't she doesn't have the confidence it's not yes. that she doesn't have the ability she doesn't have the confidence so yeah. that's where the bond is that that's where the bond between the two comes time to take our first break of the podcast when we come back we'll be talking a little bit about a, a coincidental YouTube video that Risa and I watched that reminded us both of the dog in this story so stay tuned you're listening to the GSMC book review podcast and I will be right back Hey, it's Sarah here to tell you about the Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all in one dryer brush. I just took this traveling with me and it is amazing in that it is a three in one tool. I didn't have to pack extra equipment with me just for my hair on this trip. It has a hair dryer, it is a volumizer, it is a detangler. It can do all of these things in one step. The large oval brush creates glam waves. The bristles painlessly remove knots as you dry and style. It uses ionic technology to create a frizz-free look effortlessly. Speaking of that frizz-free look, there are three heat settings plus a cool setting that will lock in your look for effortless looking hairstyles. It's got a bonus volumizing attachment included that gives you added lift at the roots and the removable attachments make storage at home or away super easy. Like I said, I just traveled with it and it was so easy and so convenient. If you would like your very own Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all-in-one dryer brush, simply go to conair.com and search dryer brush. Again, that is conair, C-O-N-A-I-R.com and search dryer brush. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Risa and I are speaking with author Christine Isley Farmer about her wonderful children's book, Finding My Yip. Let's go ahead and return now to the interview with Christine. Sure. 
Risa, do you remember last night we we found we were what, what was it that we heard that story about the dog who couldn't yep as a puppy and then later on do you remember that we encountered a similar story after we read your book and now I can't remember where it was where it was that we TikTok? maybe TikTok I don't know but the dog oh. no it was TikTok it was that Chihuahua oh it was actually it was a, a scene from America's Got Talent and the Chihuahua came on and sang with her and he he didn't bark as a as a as a puppy but then when she started singing with him he started barking it was the same almost the same story as oh, as yours yeah. it was great yeah except there's not any there was no magic in the tiktok one is there right right no magic do you want to talk a little yeah. bit about the magic well the magic is that that nana weathers has a magic ring yes and we all know that dogs cannot sing words and she's not and she's not able to teach him to sing words but her magic ring allows her to teach him how to match pitch. Yes. Okay, and that's how that gets started. And, of course, she does that as a way of bonding the, the two together because uh, bonding Chloe with Boomer even more because he has the confidence to get up and, and bark sing in front of Robbie and Hoppy. Mm -hmm. They're friends. And yes. so when she sees that he's willing to do that, and he still, and he also is not confident that you can, as you read in the book, he's not confident at his high notes. Right. And he cracks. Yep. yep. Uh, but, but he's willing to take a chance and a risk. And she, Chloe learns from that. Yes. And it's yes. a big lesson for her. So, yeah. And, I mean, they both, I think it's such a nice story that the uh, characters parallel one another as far as their confidence in what they're doing yes. and taking a risk. And as you and I know as adults, we have to take risk in life. Sometimes we, I don't mean dangerous risk, but we have to take risk in life to grow. Right, right. We have to leave our comfort zones. Exactly. Yes. All right, Risa, do you want to ask this next question? Sure. What types of research did you do for the book? Oh, okay. Well, I was really interesting since I was writing about stuttering to learn a little bit more about stuttering. And, um, you know, I, I learned there are a lot of famous actors and singers who stuttered as children. And they mm -hmm. may still study today. Uh, uh, I don't know if... Risa might not know some of these actors and actresses, but Marilyn Monroe stuttered, oh. James Earl Jones, mm -hmm. uh, plus our president, Joe Biden, yep. is a stutterer. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Carly Simon, I don't know if, if you remember her or not, as a singer, and Mel Tipton. There are, there are a number of famous people who, um, who stutter. And they have overcome that as singers and actors. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I was especially interested in what is it about singing that makes it possible for stutterers to sing. And that's because of the left brain, right brain activity. Okay. The right brain, in musical activities, the right brain takes over. In language activities, it's the left brain. So when you're singing, you're accessing a different part of your brain, and also the articulators like your tongue and your mouth, uh, your palate, all of that uh, reacted differently to as when um, differently to when as when you sing uh, when you speak. Mm -hmm. Speaking is different; activates the different articulators in a, a different way. Well, so I did a little research on that before I started writing about. A stuttering child and mm -hmm. of course uh, in the book this this book uh, it doesn't mention her having a speech therapist but she will eventually work with a speech therapist right. in the later book yes yes what um, about this age range do you enjoy in terms of, of writing for for younger readers oh well, that's an interesting question um, I don't know. I think that at that that they're at their age, this age that I'm writing for, 
they're very impressionable. And as a former educator, and I still consider myself an educator when I'm writing these books, I'm really mm-hmm. interested in in teaching children about uh, diversity, uh, about uh, disability, how to mm-hmm. interact with one another, how to be sensitive, how yeah. to be empathetic. Uh, so I think this is a really good age to address those issues mm-hmm. because they're already in school. They're exposed to, when they're in school, they're exposed to different uh, types of children, different problems. Um, you know, a lot of children are bullied in school. And so yes. I, I include bullying in, in my book. Uh, so how do, how do you work with that as a child and you come across that type of behavior? How do you, how do you not feel like you are worthless because you're being teased by other people? How do you find your own sense of self-worth? And it, I mean, that comes from parenting as well, but it also has to come from inside yourself. Yeah. I think that at that age, that age group, and you're the mother of a child that's nine, uh, 10, um, and Chloe is nine. So I think that's a really good age to start teaching children about those mm-hmm. kind of things. They've already encountered it in school, and those who are entering school are going to encounter it. Right. Yep. Absolutely. There Even are, in, kindergarten, in kindergarten, they start to as well. Oh, yeah. It, it, probably even preschool, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is listed as um, book one of Boomer's Tales. So we were curious. How many books do you want to write for the series? Well, um, I have already. The second one is coming out in November, and it's a mystery. It has the same cast of characters. It's called A Hard Nut to Crack. And uh, mm-hmm. that one comes out in, in Nova, I think we're, the, public, the launch date is going to be November the 9th. Uh, but okay. I have three others after that that I've written the rough drafts for. So the third one is called Camp Resound, and that's going to deal with um, a music camp. And the fourth one is called Long Lost Elvis, and that deals, <laughs> I have a, Main character in there that's another animal, and that one is a donkey. <laughs> oh, fun! And the fifth one is called Bongo Learns His Lesson, and this is and it, it includes all of them will have some kind of music in them, more or less music or less. There's some that have more and some that have less. But Bongo is an African gray parrot, and he's um, he has a habit of. Uh, uh, squawking, not nice words. <laughs> oh, sure. He wants to learn how not to do that, and he uh, has some musical experiences himself. So, and I'm not sure about the sixth one yet. Uh, I've been so busy getting these others uh, ready to go to the uh, publisher and the illustrations on all, all of that that uh, I haven't written the sixth one yet. But the other, there are five for sure. All right. And uh, can you talk a little bit about the illustrator and uh, how you work together? Well, the illustrator is uh, here in in Murfreesboro, where I live. And I actually met him uh, through his father, who is now deceased. Uh, His father and I were uh, colleagues uh, on the School of Music faculty. His father was a pianist, and his mother is a cellist, and she taught there. She was an adjunct for a while there too but i had asked taylor bills is my illustrator uh when i was the opera director at mtsu i knew about his talent from his parents and he developed he uh designed a few sets for me for the opera program and i had sort of followed him along and i knew that he was great at illustrating so when i came up with the idea of these books i thought he's the number one person i wanted to ask and luckily, he has been willing to work with me on the, well, so far on the set, we've only, the, the illustrations have been completed for the, the second book. But I hope okay. he's going to follow through all of this, the series. Yeah, that would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. All right, Risa has another question. Why did you, all right. uh, why did you want to become a writer? Oh, that's, that's also another interesting question. 
Well, you would think that I had had a sing as I had had a singing career. Where did writing come from? Well, um, even as a child, uh, I made up stories. I can remember in the fifth grade, I made up a story about the missing white station wagon. <laughs> it was a little mystery, and yeah. um, I do write and I do write poems. I mean, before I retired, I was already writing poems, and uh, I started writing these books before I retired. Uh, I didn't have a lot of time to write during the uh, academic year, but in the summertime when I have, was not teaching full time, I started writing these stories. So the kernel of writing has always been there, but the thrust of making it more of um, a, a, a thrust of more energy into writing uh, has happened more since retirement. Mm -hmm. And that's been a year. I was retired for a year. I've been retired from my university position for a year. Oh, but I, oh, I what, think what an odd year to be retired. <laughs> exactly. In fact, I was still teaching when uh, the university was closed down for the pandemic. So I had to finish out the uh, semester teaching on Zoom, which I had never done before. So I had to be a quick yeah. learner. And so yeah. did the students. We had to be quick learners, too. But mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's been a good year uh, for writing because you're not pulled into all of these outside activities that, you know, one is usually pulled into. Right. Uh, regardless of whether you're retired or not, I'm, I'm already getting more busy with things outside of my writing uh, because things have revved up again. Yeah. You're able to meet again. But I was going to also say another thing about writing. When mm -hmm. you think about writing... It's a voice, too. And so for years I sang, and that was expression of my voice, my singing voice. But writing is also the expression of a voice. So I feel like it's very compatible uh, with my singing career mm -hmm. and teaching career. You know, you said you, you wrote a story in fifth grade about a white station wagon, a missing white station wagon. Well, Risa just finished fourth grade, so she'll be going into fifth grade in the fall. And I love writing mysteries. She writes mysteries also. Yay, Risa! <laughs> in fact, when I, when I got here, she gave me a gift of a couple of uh, her stories that she's written. So it's very exciting, and I love that she she loves to read and write. And now I've embarrassed her, and she's making an embarrassed face. <laughs> Well, Risa, I think that's wonder wonderful. What's the name of what are the name of your stories that you wrote? Abigail Smith, but the mystery at the cemetery. What is it, Sam and Sadie? Yeah, Sam and Sadie book one, Allie Simpson, and the author's autobiography. Then there's the second Abigail Smith, which I don't remember the name of, but it was about her friend being kidnapped. Oh my and, goodness! Yeah, she, I didn't realize she was quite this prolific. <laughs> you are well. Are you are you familiar with Goosebumps? Mm -mm. The series Goosebumps, mm -mm. R.L. Stein. You mm -mm. never read those? Mm -mm. They're kind of they're kind of oh, scary. Oh, you like? Oh, that's yeah. Actually, I'm reading Piano Lessons Can Be Murder right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Not I'm piano not lessons. Talking, but you know, I think it's important when you. Um, when you are a children's book writer, that you write, you read children's books too. I agree. So I, I had never read a Charlotte's Web, and so I, oh, wow. I bought that. Have you read that? I have read it. I have it in my cupboard. Yep. Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting started on that because I never. Uh, that came out after you know I was already an adult, but I okay. thought, well, now that I'm reading children's books, guess what? I'm going to go back. I'm writing children's books. I'm going to go back and read some of these, like Maggie and the Magic Tree House. I've read several of those. I've read mm -hmm. the Poppy series. Uh, you know, uh, really well written children's books. I think so. Um, I just, I just love that Risa is already writing her own stories. I, I do too. It's wonderful. That's great. I'm going to jump in here so we can take our second break of the podcast, but I know I'm a little biased, but I'm hoping that someday I'll be interviewing Risa for this book review podcast once she 
puts you know more stories together and and gets some of those published i think that would be awesome if you know that's what she decides she wants to do when she grows up right now she's got about 52 different options on what she wants to do depending on what day you talk to her so let's take that break when we come back we'll be hearing from christine about her advice for aspiring authors stay tuned you're listening to the gsmc book review podcast and i'll be right back Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with Christine Isley Farmer. We are talking about her new children's book, Finding My Yip. Yeah. Well, um, Christine, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Aspiring authors are uh, uh, people who want to write. So. Well, what, the way I started, because, you know, I had written academic articles. That's different from creative writing and you're wanting to get published or mm-hmm. think of it more seriously. Um, I started here in Murfreesboro. We have a, a library called the Linebow Library. And mm-hmm. there was a writer's group. And I started going and participating in that. They, we had weekly meetings. And you would bring, you know, say five pages of whatever you wrote, you had written and share it with the group, and you would get some comments, criticism, uh, but it was a good way to sort of get your work out there. So I started off with that uh, when I started writing Finding My Yip. But I also, for aspiring writers, I think it's interesting and important that you go to writers' conferences. I know that I uh, uh, have, have gone to those and the important part of that is that you get to read, you get to talk to people who are doing it professionally. You get inside tips uh, about writing. And sometimes you're able to, depending on the conference, you're able to, if you're writing something, you have a chance to uh, plug it with or, or promote it with a literary agent. You might find an agent to, who wants to represent you, who would, you know, uh, represent you with to publishers who are interested in your particular kind of genre of books. But uh, I think in per- participating in writers' conferences, especially if you're a beginning writer, you get to learn, oh, I didn't know that was expected, or these are the kinds of things I need to be doing. And then to have uh, uh, find a local writing group that you can share your work with and get some feedback and get tips. and. Uh, I think that's also important. So those are tips I would give for aspiring writers. And the other thing is write. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I have to say that because it's very difficult, and I have found that difficult too because you you can get so – a lot of aspiring writers are working day jobs. They're doing other things. They don't write full time. But finding a time and a place, especially a place where it's quiet, you can concentrate. You are not distracted. And, uh, you know, I remember writing, getting up and writing early in the morning. But whatever time frame, some people would write better maybe after they are off work and they've had dinner and they want to just have a, some time to themselves to write in the evening. But find what's best for you because the secret of writing, in a way, is you write, then you rewrite, then you rewrite, then you rewrite. <laughs> 
<laughs> writers, are, writers are just mostly not ever satisfied with with their books. I know that's been the way with me. It's like, oh, I've got to turn this loose. Am I ready to turn it loose? Uh, so when yeah. you get to the point that you are ready, thinking, oh, I want to try to get my work published, if you get with a publisher, you will have an editor who will um, will edit your books. But for me, I decided I wanted to go the self-publishing route, and but I hired someone to proof my writing. When mm-hmm. I got my books to the point, I said, oh, I'm sort of ready to let go to get them edited. Then I sent them to someone I thought I trusted to, to edit them for me. So I mm-hmm. think that's a part, that's important in the stages. But when you're a beginning writer, it's just write, write, get with a group that is enjoying, that enjoys sharing their work and you can share yours and get some feedback. Okay. Thank you for that. I think you've answered this a little bit, but Risa has one more question for you. What have you been mm-hmm. reading? Oh, I don't know if she, if she heard you say it again. What, ha- what have you been reading? Oh, what have I been reading? Well, I told you I was starting um, on the goosebump, and mm-hmm. um, and we have a um, uh, indie bookshop here where I live called The Crying Cat. And uh, I went in there, and I just went through rifle. They have a children's library, so I rifled through that and bought through uh, uh, several books. But uh, because I'm an adult, I'm also reading some nonfiction. I read two books recently. One is Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, and the other one is The Warmth of Other Suns by the same author. And uh, uh, I don't know if... Sarah, if you are are acquainted with these books or not, but I've heard they of both, the second one, but I haven't read it. Oh, the warmth of, the, of you. You've heard of the second one, but you haven't read it. Yeah. Okay, so the warmth of other suns deals with the Great Migration, and the Great Migration uh, is the the impetus of the blacks uh, who were had been you know the had been quote emancipated after the mm-hmm. Civil War to uh, and had seen that that really uh, the emancipation was not what it was all touted to be and of course there were a lot of Jim Crow laws in the in the South and the blacks were not treated well they were mistreated and yes. uh, this is about their migration to uh, the North and to the West. They also, and uh, she deals with three characters and their families. One character is from Florida, and my, they migrate to uh, New York City. Uh, another character is from, I believe, uh, Mississippi, and he's actually a physician, and he uh, he he moves to California. And the other one is a woman, and she moves to the Chicago area, the north, you know, the uh, what I call the the Northwest sort of middle Northwest. Mm-hmm. And she follows stories of all of they She follows the, their stories, and they're actually so fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and you learn a lot about racism, and you learn about that racism doesn't p- disappear because you move. Right. Unfortunately, no. You move. It doesn't, and uh, especially with the doctor who uh, became a famous doctor in L.A., uh, you know, he encountered, I remember what he said, and he wrote in his book, he said, as soon as he crossed the line, uh, you know, crossed the Texas line, thinking he was leaving the South, and he mm. drove into New Mexico and Arizona, he could not get a motel room. Everywhere he stopped, uh-huh. people said, we're, we're full, we're full. It yeah. wasn't until he got into California that he could actually find a place to stay. And still, uh, racism was a part of, of the West as well. So yeah. uh, it, it's when you read this, you wonder, you know, if you haven't walked in the feet, if you're a different race, if you're white, you're You've never walked in the feet, and I'm white. Uh, you've never walked in the pe- the feet of these people. You've not walked into their past. 
nor mm-hmm. into the present, nor into their future. So I just found that book. Uh, I mean, I enjoyed Cast because she talks about racism in America. But she talks about Nazism, and she also discusses the Dalits in um, in India, who mm-hmm. were in some ways treated as poorly or more poorly than our uh, in, in, than our African Americans or blacks. Yes, but uh, those two books have really been uh, interesting to me. And now I've started Stamped. I don't know if you've heard about that. I'm not sure. Who's the author? Okay. Again, it's, it, it, it starts with, in the 1400s, the beginning of racism, the culture theory about that all in the, in the United States, why it happened, how it's been just, you know, uh, furthered. And it, it's, it's, continues you know it's the way we think we think the way we've been taught to think <clears throat> the way we've been educated so mm-hmm. um i'm just starting that one but i i'm very interested in this i guess with the george floyd trial it really brought things to a head for me as far as what's going on in our country i mean i'm brought up in the south a lot of things that i grew up with were things that i just you know, I assume they were the way they were because that's the way they, they were supposed to be. As mm-hmm. an adult, as an older adult, I see that was all wrong. Yeah. And that's not the way we should live any longer. Yeah. Well, I, I see it from a, a slightly different perspective in that, you know, I'm, I'm also white and I grew up in Montana, which is not hugely diverse. Well, at least my hometown wasn't. But then my husband now is black. And so I've seen I've seen his experience, seen through his eyes and the experiences that he's mm-hmm. had and, you know, getting the, the amount of times he gets pulled over, just, you know, just a lot of different things that yeah. I'd heard about, but now I'm seeing firsthand. You're seeing it. Yes. You're living yeah. it. Your yeah. husband lives it and you and your daughter are living it. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> and it has to change, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, it does. It just has to change. I mean, when you look at the diversity in our country, I mean, we have Hispanics, we have Asians, we have Blacks. We are, we have a gift here. We yes. have a gift here. We have the diversity that a lot of the world doesn't even have or know about. I uh, agree. So we need to embrace that and uh, stop fighting it and stop, and stop the hate is what I say. Stop the well, hate. Well, I agree. I agree. I definitely agree. We're going to go ahead, though, and take our final break of the podcast. Something the something interesting is that um, Christine referred to Risa as my daughter, mistakenly, and Risa is my niece. I've been saying that throughout. But it's interesting because she said, Christine said something about things that my husband and I face as an interracial couple, and, um, you know, she included our Risa as our daughter in that, and Risa does actually happen to be mixed race. She is um, African American and Caucasian. Uh, she just doesn't happen to be our daughter. <laughs> she's she's my sister's younger daughter. She's both of my sister's children are adopted. My fifteen year old niece is Chinese, and my ten year old niece is mixed race. And it's wonderful, and I love having that diversity in our family. And when my husband and I go anywhere with Risa, people think that she's ours, and we are, of course, perfectly okay with <laughs> with that because she she is ours. She's just not our daughter. She's she's but she's still our baby niece. So. Anyway, let's take our final break of the podcast. And when we come back, the conclusion of this interview with Christine Isley Farmer. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. Time to hashtag everything. We talk about all the fun, crazy stories on social media. From Instagram to Facebook, Twitter to Tumblr, or probably even Friendster. Join us each week as we explore the quirky side of social media. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. It's simple, it's simple, such a sad song. The one that... That we rely on to get us, to get us. 
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with Christine Isley Farmer. Remember that before the break we were talking about race and issues that have been facing this country in the past, well, way too many years, of course, but definitely been more in the forefront lately, but um, we're going to change the subject slightly as we go into the conclusion of this interview. Um, well, on a slightly di- different note, <laughs> that, all, that was all very, very important, but um, I know you have a website, so if you can uh, share your website as well as where uh, people can find you on social media. Yes, I can. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. <laughs> okay. So, so they, they can on all of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, and... Um, on my Facebook, I have an author page and a personal page. So I have two different pages. So if people are interested from the writing standpoint, uh, they can friend me on my um, on my uh, author page. Okay. Um, I, have, I do have a website, and it's www.goodreadsbychristine.com. And if you go on that, you can look at... Well, uh, I just think it's a really nice website, <laughs> but uh, you can you can read more about me, and also you can read reviews that have come out about the book. If you're thinking about buying it for a child, you can your child or children, you can read what other people have had to say about it. Uh, you can also order the book from my website because it has buttons for Barnes and Noble and Amazon, and of course has Bookshop on there too. Uh, so I wanted to include the indie uh, bookstores as well, but um, yeah, that's where you can find me. And if you you also if you want to sign up for, I haven't really started it yet because I've been so busy with promoting the first book that. But I do have you can sign up uh, uh, for a newsletter or uh, give me your email and I'll contact you if I have. If I have something special I want to offer you, or to just to keep you in touch with what's going on. All right, thank you. Well, Christine, we've talked about a lot of different things today, but is there anything that we haven't touched on that you were hoping to be able to talk about during our time together? I think that you um, ask you ask about every question that. Uh, you sent me ahead of time. <laughs> yes. I think all we, right. uh, we covered it all. Yes. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your weekend to talk to me and to talk to Risa, who has um, disappeared to go uh, do other things now. Um, but uh, uh, thank you so much for letting her join us. Well, I loved it. It was wonderful to have a young reader in on the conversation. <laughs> yes. And, and I'm really loves, talking to you the book, well. and she's excited about the next one. Oh, good. Well, she, if she likes mystery, she'll like this one. <laughs> the yeah, second absolutely. one, too. <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. So thank you once again to Christine for joining me and especially for being so kind and letting Risa be part of the interview. Uh, She did not have to do that. I asked ahead of time if she would mind and she said absolutely. So thank you, Christine, for that, for your wonderful conversation, the the wonderful conversation that we had. And I really enjoyed not only the conversation, but also the book, Finding My Yip. I am looking forward to reading more about Boomers and Chloe's adventures as the series continues seeing where that takes them and learning more about Nana's magic because we know she has it we don't know much about it beyond the fact that she has it and um, Reese and I both have questions (laughs) we we were actually very glad when Christine explained it a little more in the book because it's alluded to in the first parts of the book and then more is explained and Reese and I kept saying why what what is this ring what what is going on so uh, again we both thoroughly enjoyed it and if you have children in the age range that age range 7 to 12 or even older I mean really you know your your uh, children or grandchildren or 
nieces, nephews, cousins, whatever, you know their reading preferences probably. So if you have someone in that age range or someone that you think would enjoy this book, you should definitely check it out. Um, and again, Finding My Yip and the author is Christine Isley Farmer. I know I've said that a million times, but want to get that stuck in everybody's brains. I hope that you will join me for the next interview. I will be interviewing um, Mia P. Manansala, and I hope I said that right. Ah, I probably didn't. I will double check. Um, <laughs> about her book, it is a cozy mystery. It is called Arsenic and Adobe. Adobo, Adobe, geez. Arsenic and Adobo. <laughs> it might be time for me to shut things down. I can't remember my words today. Uh, arsenic and adobo. Let me say that again. It is a cozy mystery. Please join me for that interview. The book is a lot of fun and my conversation with Mia was also a lot of fun. Hope you're having a great day. Hope that um, you're surviving the heat wherever you are. It is unseasonably warm here in Montana. I brought the California weather with me. No one is happy. Uh, I have to apologize to the entire state of Montana for the heat, but I hope wherever you are, you either have a, a break from the heat or some really good AC. So thank you for joining me. If you're a fan of this podcast, uh, please do leave us a review that can be written. That can be a starred review. Also, please follow the podcast on social media. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I love to hear from readers uh, and listeners. Let me know what you're reading. Let me know if you have um, authors that you'd like to see on the podcast. I can't guarantee that I will get them on here, but I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And as I was saying, wherever you are and whatever the temperature, I hope that your day is affording you plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Moo movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program